Well, I became an aviation buff uh, about a year after I graduated from high school. I made an application for flying cadet training and I was accepted in September of, the, uh, of 1940. I went down to Ontario, California and attended the primary school there. And the particular interest of, interest of the, uh, the place was the fact that Robert L. Scott got as my co-pilot that uh, flew P-40s with the Flying Tigers with our commander. We flew PT-13s there, and then from there we went to Kelly Field and Randolph Field, where I was commissioned, and then from there I was assigned to Hamilton Field to the 21st Pursuit Squadron, a P-40 outfit. Yeah, we were uh, deployed to the Philippines on November the 1st of 1941, and we arrived in Manila on the 20th of December, 41, and 18 days later, the war started. And, um, the first day of the war, I was flying over Clark Field and uh, got into a fight with Saburo Sakai, who was the leading living ace of the Japanese Air Force. And um, he shot me up pretty badly. He had put a big hole in my left wing, hit the cartridge can. And uh, fortunately, I went into a dive and I outdove. The, actually, there were two zeros on me. And I flew towards Nichols Field, and I looked back, and I noticed that both of them had made a 180-degree turn and flew back to Clark Field to finish the strafing they were doing on the Park B-17s and, and the P-40s. And I went back to Nichols Field and landed, and the uh, aircraft was put into repair. And late that afternoon, we took off again. We were going to bring the aircraft to Clark Field. And the reason for that was that Clark had been heavily bombed. In fact, it was obliterated. And uh, it was logical to assume that the next target would be Nichols Field. So we want to get our airplanes out of there. So we went to Clark Field. And of course, Clark Field was just loaded with bomb craters. Airplanes were on fire, B-17s. In fact, they, they caught the whole Far East Air Force on the ground and neutralized them actually the first day of the war. And then uh, we flew several missions subsequent to that. And uh, on the 9th of April of 42, uh, we surrendered. And I participated in the Bataan Death March, which was a grueling, brutal litany of hunger, thirst, beheadings, shootings, bayonetings. Um, and at the termination of the death march, which happened at, at uh, San Fernando Pampanga in Pampanga province, they put us into a uh, narrow gauge metal boxcars. And normally, I would say about 25 people would have been comfortable in there, but they put 100 of us in there. And it was just stifling heat. There was no ventilation. And we were filthy. Most of the guys had amoebic dysentery. Their clothes were saturated with human waste. And the stink was just terrible. I thought I was going to suffocate, it was so bad. And we finally got to a place called Capus where we unloaded us. Then we marched another nine miles to, um, to Camp O'Donnell. And in Camp O'Donnell, there were 14,000 Filipinos that died in the two months that I was incarcerated there and around about 1,100 Americans. And then from there, after I was incarcerated there for two months, they transferred us to Cabana de Juan and I was in command of one for five months. And men were dying, Americans were dying 50, 60, every day, every day. In fact, uh, 3,000 Americans died in command of one. From command of one, they brought me to, uh, they put me on a prison ship and we sailed to Mindanao, the island of Mindanao. And we were in prison there at the Duval Penal Colony, which was formerly a, a uh, Philippine prison for hardened criminals. And um, I was in there for five months. And then on the 4th of April of 1943, 10 of us escaped. And at the time I escaped, I weighed about 85 pounds, just to give you an idea of the condition. That was typical. Now, the other lads that escaped with me, one of them was Ed Dias. They named Dias Air Force Base after him in Abilene, Texas. Ed, three months after he got home, was taken off from Burbank, California, in the P-38. And right after he broke ground, his left engine caught a fire, and he crashed into a Catholic church steeple and burned up. Um, 
We had three Marines that escaped with us, Mike Dobrovich, Shifty Schaffner, Jack Hawkins, an Annapolis graduate. We had a naval uh, commander, uh, Melvin H. McCoy, and a West Point graduate, uh, Steve Melanick, and there were two enlisted men that were with us, uh, Bob Spielman and uh, Paul Marshall. And Leo Bolins was also a member of the Army Air Corps. He was our engineering officer. And we all got home with the exception of Leo. Leo was recaptured and uh, was brutally executed. It was difficult to maintain your sanity, but you had to have a will to live. You had to believe in something. And those of us that knew how to pray, I think that was a big help to us. Uh, I can say straight away that I just had strong faith. I was brought up that way. And that was the biggest thing I said I had was my religion. Well, it was either escape or die. And I f we all figured that uh, if we remained in prison camp the way they were dying, at the rate they were dying, that just a matter of months before, if we were the last ones to die, maybe we had two or three months to go. And uh, even though we were all sick of the, the members of the escape group, uh, the big question our mark in our mind, we want to stay here and die like a bunch of animals or do we want to get out and get shot and die that way? So when we left, uh, uh, of course, freedom was, was foremost in our mind. Um, you know, your person doesn't realize how important freedom is until you lose it. And when you lose it, uh, then you can appreciate the American type of freedom because we, even though we have a lot of problems in this world today, uh, I think the United States of America still has the finest brand of freedom that is available. Most of the men would usually match up with another guy because if you didn't have a buddy to take care of you, uh, when you got sick, he'd take care of you. When he got sick, you'd take care of him. For example, uh, if you had a malarial chill, it was difficult to get in the mess line and walk to pick up your rice. Well, the other guy would take care of that for you. Um, I was fortunate in that I had Ed Dias as a good buddy, my, my squadron commander, and uh, Leo Golden, who was from uh, Mobile, Alabama. Uh, he died on the Orioka Maru. There were 1,600 located on this prison ship that was unmarked. And uh, the first ship was sunk right near Lingayan, Lingayan Gulf, near Subic Bay. And they took the survivors of that ship and put them on the second ship. And then right off of Formosa, that ship was sunk. They took the survivors off of that one and put it on the third ship. And finally, when they got to Japan, there was something less than 400 alive out of the 1600 started. And they say that was a terror. I had a lot of good friends on board that ship that, that survived and told me about it. And, uh, it's just incredible. You know, the, the, the closer you get to the truth, the more incredible that treatment becomes. You, it's hard to believe. In fact, I've talked to several prisoners, and they've told me that uh, I don't want to discuss my experiences as a Japanese prisoner of war. Nobody believed me. And that's the truth. One thing comes to mind, Lynn, is the uh, conduct of the, uh, of the clergy. And I'm not going to single out any denomination. Of course, I was particularly interested in the Catholic priest because I happen to be a Catholic. But there were many, many Protestant chaplains that conducted themselves admirably. Uh, they really were an inspiration to a lot of us. Uh, I recall one priest, uh, Father Albert Brown, a Franciscan, and uh, he was as hungry as we were. And I've seen him give his food to prisoners that needed it. Well, like he felt was they needed it more than he did. And you know, it's hard to understand the sacrifice involved there until you've been hungry, when you've been starved to death, you know. Food, you, you, you become like an animal. And you do things that you're ashamed to talk about, just to stay alive. Um, like I say, the closer to the truth that you get to what happened on the death march and in the prison camps, the more incredible the truth becomes. There's no question about it. Well, I can tell you a couple of things that I saw on the March of Death, and I can relate something that happened to me personally in the uh, prison camp. Uh, on the march, I saw a Filipino scout with both of his legs amputated, and the bandages were still soiled with blood. 
And this poor little guy had just been released from the hospital. In fact, he was forced out of the hospital to participate in the death march. And he was on his stomach dragging himself. And I saw a tank, a Japanese tank, coming in the opposite direction that we were marching, deliberately swerve from its course and catch an American under its track. And this literally crushed him into the ground and his body became a part of the ground. When I passed him, he just saw us, uh, just, just a pile of blood on him. He was soiled with blood. Um, about the fourth day out, we, uh, they changed the guard and coming down the line of march was the information that if we dug in the ground, there were wild turnips. Well, I wasn't going to begin to dig in the ground because I saw what was happening. You know, if any, any uh, uh, disobedience of their instructions, that was sudden death. You know, now they'd shoot you or ban at you, no question about it. Um, Leo Golden, my buddy who died on the Oyuruka Maru, uh, he dug down the ground and came up with two turnips. And he's in the process of handing me one and this Jap guard with a fixed bayonet came from around the, the rear. And he took a swing at Leo with a bamboo stick that he had, bamboo pole. And he swung at him and Leo ducked and boom, it hit me right across the face and knocked up this, didn't knock the tooth out, but knocked the side of the tooth out. And God, I thought, you know, just terrible. And I finally, when we got to the prison camp, I found a, a oral surgeon, Dr. Art Irons, who recently died. He was from San Antonio. And he had a pair of pliers, didn't have any dental equipment. And um, there was another young doctor, a graduate of Baylor, another dentist. And he held my head while Dr. Irons pulled that tooth out. And of course, my main concern was with that, uh, where the tooth was pulled out, I was worried about getting an infection because you know your, your immune system held you. You just you, you didn't have much resistance at all. But fortunately, nothing happened. Another time, after I got into Camp O'Donnell, they sent me out with a, a group of 25 enlisted men, and our instructions were to go into the town of Tarlac, which was oh about I don't know maybe 20 miles from the camp, 25 miles from the camp, <clears throat> and. Uh, we were to load 158 pound bags of rice onto these Japanese trucks. There were five trucks that took 25 of us out to, the, to this warehouse. And before we left, the Japanese camp commander, through the interpreter, told me, he said, now we know that there are many Filipinos that are still loyal to the Americans, but you have no contact with them, you stay away from them, and if there's any violations of this, you'll be severely punished. So then I got the 25 enlisted men and explained to them what the camp commander told me. So we proceeded on to Tarlac and uh, the men started loading these 158 pound bags. And that was a sad sight to see because here the guys were all, had just finished the march of death and they'd been through hell, you know, and here they were trying to lift 158 pound bags of rice. Um, and I was making the rounds to keep, be sure they kept busy so we wouldn't get in trouble. And uh, about that time, a little Filipino lad, I'd estimate him to be maybe 14 or 15 years old, and he had a gunny sack strung over his shoulder, half full, half, half full, and he was whistling God Bless America, and he dropped. But anyway, he uh, <clears throat> dropped the sack, and of course I understood immediately he wanted me to go over and pick up the sack. And I went over, in the meantime he started walking away and about that time here comes a Jap guard and saw what happened and he took this little guy and just beat him unmercifully into unconsciousness. Then he came over to me and slapped me a couple of times and took me to another warehouse which was about, oh, maybe a block away from the warehouse that we were unloading this rice from. And along the, uh, the warehouse was a railroad, a rail and there were about 500 Japanese soldiers all in full combat load. And I assumed that they were gonna participate in the invasion of, of Corregidor, or probably were gonna go out to fight the guerrillas. But he went over and talked to them, and five of them broke ranks, and they finally brought me in this other warehouse. And they gave me the worst beating I ever had in my life. They blackened my eye, they knocked out two lower teeth, bloody nose. And then of course the thought that was predominant in my mind was the embarrassment to have to go back and face those men because I did just exactly what I told them not to do. Well, I went back 
And this is the time when I met my first good Japanese. He was the, the driver of the truck that I had come out on. And he saw me and saw I was a bloody mess. And he gave me a big smile and kind of patted me on the back. Then he pointed in the back of the truck and he had taken that sack. And I didn't know what was in that sack that little Filipino boy had. And he put him in the middle of the, um, of the other rice bags that had been loaded on this truck. And, uh, and he gave me this signal here, don't say anything, see. So finally we loaded all the trucks. We went back to the prison camp, to Camp O'Donnell. And the guard that drove the truck that I rode on escorted us to the main gate where the, where the guard was to get us through the gate. And he had given one of the lads, one of the enlisted men, the sack. And then he escorted us through so the guard wouldn't stop us. Well, finally, when we got in the back of the prison camp, I was certain anxious to find out what the hell's in there. And we opened up the sack, and there were there were uh, sugar cakes, shaped like like a dis like a small discus. And uh, it's amazing how much energy, quick energy, we got from eating just a couple of bites of that sugar. Just amazing. Well, you know, psychologists tell us that we, we tend to forget the unpleasant experiences of life and we retain the good things. Well, I can't agree 100% because uh, some of the things, and not, not only me, I mean, anyone that survived and went through those experiences, uh, you're never gonna forget those things. That's why so many of them have the uh, delayed stress syndrome. Um, you feel that's real? Oh, they're, they're, Lynn, there's no question about it. There's no question about it. I, I know myself now. I know that a little while ago I kind of broke down a little bit. Um, I'm not the only one that goes through that. Uh, there's been nightmares. Um, you, um, you actually feel guilty sometimes because why did I survive and here all these great guys are six feet under the ground. Uh, so when you talk about the delayed stress syndrome, uh, it's real, you bet it's real. Bernard Norlin, Dr. Bernard Norling, a history teacher at Notre Dame, was a good friend of mine. In fact, uh, he visited me one, this, uh, 1980, I believe, yeah, 19, no. Yeah, 1981. And in the course of conversation, he said, Sam, why don't you write a book? I said, well, I don't have that kind of talent. Uh, I, said, I, I said, if I had someone like you to help me, I would give it some serious consideration. He said, I'll take a sabbatical. And he said, well, sit down, we'll write this book. I said, fine. So he went back to South Bend. And then later on, he took the sabbatical and he came out. And I have a place out of Ponder Rain. We spent a lot of time out there where it was quiet. And, and uh, we started on the book. And then in the course of time, I made quite a few tapes for him that I sent to him. He did a lot of research. And uh, I tell you, it, it wasn't too difficult. I'll tell you why. When I first got home after I escaped, I was assigned to the Treasury Department for 18 months, and all I did was run around the country selling war bonds. And the subject of the talks was Japanese atrocities. I remember one day in Jersey City, New Jersey, I gave 15 talks in one day, and I'm talking about atrocities, atrocities, atrocities. And um, consequently, uh, and then that, during that time period, there were a lot of news articles that came out about the atrocity because we were the first group that came home and told about the March of Death. MacArthur didn't know about the March of Death. And three of the lads that got out before I did on the submarine, McCoy, Melnick, and Dias, in uh, Brisbane, Australia, they were interviewed by MacArthur. And of course, MacArthur learned at that time what happened to the boys that surrendered on Bataan and Krigadar. So, uh, with that, and like I say, all the newspaper articles which I kept, uh, I was able to give fairly realistic uh, information on, on what the March of Death was all about, what the prison camp life was all about, and the cruelty of the Japanese. I'll tell you one thing, Lynn, that, uh, that gives me comfort anyway, is the fact that I think when Truman made the decision to drop those atomic bombs, knowledge of what was happening to the boys on Bataan and Corregidor made it easy for him to make that decision to drop those two atomic bombs. And the American people to cheer it. There's no question about it. Because no one, I wrote 2,100 letters when I came home. 
And the majority of letters were to mothers, dads, sisters, and brothers that hadn't heard a word. They didn't know anything about the March of Death or the numbers of people that were dying over there. So I think our escape in a way was, was helpful. It definitely was. Well, I, I think if there's something that had to be done, I, you've heard say, I'm sure, many times that it probably saved a million lives. There's no question about it. If we'd invaded the mainland of Japan, the Japanese islands, there wouldn't be one prisoner alive because the civilians would have killed them. There's no question about that. You talk to anybody that has any knowledge of, the, of, the, of those conditions in, in the Japanese uh, mind, and they'll tell you the same thing. I don't think a, a, a prisoner wouldn't have, would, wouldn't have survived if we had invaded their, their, their homeland. Well, uh, I went there a little bit uh, with certain reservations in my mind, but, but before I go into that, uh, I don't have any animosity towards the Japanese because I wasn't brought up that way. How in the hell can you say they are father and hate these people? Now, there's some that still do. There's no question about it, and I can understand it. But you, you forgive, but we don't forget. Um, when I first met Saburo, he was down in Fredericksburg, te Texas, at the Admiral Nimitz Museum, and uh, the way I was invited down there, this curator, Helen McDonald, called me and asked me if I'd participate in a symposium in Austin, Texas. I believe, what's his name, Maria Walter Cronkite was the, the MC, as I recall. And there were going to be several of the, the Pacific uh, veterans there. Um, and I said, well, what, what do you want me there for? She said, well, we've located the, the Jap that shot you up. I said, well, how do you know who shot me up? I said, I don't even know who it is. Yeah, well, I asked the question. I said, now, how do you know that this gentleman shot me, didn't shoot me down, but actually shot up my left wing? She said, well, we read the report that you had submitted, and we read his report, and then Bill Bartsch, who wrote Doomed at the Start, it took him 13 years to write it, and he did a lot of research, and he was positive that it was Saburo Sakai because of the circumstances and the way I explained it and the way Saburo had explained it. So I accepted that, and I said that I, I would participate. So I went down to uh, Fredericksburg, and Saburo had arrived there before I had with his daughter, Michiko, and uh, her husband. I believe his name was Terry. And they had a, he had a little grandson, Saburo's grandson. And uh, when I first approached Saburo, I put out my hand to shake hands with him. And he shook his hand like this, and he, he wanted to shake hand like this, and then he hit his chest, his fighter pilot. <laughs> when I got it, that, that cooled things off. I mean, right away, I figured, hell, this guy's got a sense of humor. So then he went over and I shook hands and he put his arm around me. And uh, through his daughter, he mentioned, he said, you know, he says, uh, uh, I don't dislike you. He says, you're a gentleman. And he says, uh, you deserve to live the same as I deserve to live. And he said, you were fighting for your country, doing what you believe was right. And he said, I was fighting for my country. I believe we were right. And finally, after three or four days, I got quite friendly with him and uh, we were in the Lyndon Bain Johnson Library in, in Austin, Texas. And with Saburo was uh, Abe Singe, who led the flight of valve dive bombers that sunk the Arizona. And he was captured too and spent uh, some time in a prison camp in Guam. And also there was a, a fellow named Sakamaki who was one of the two men that uh, was the crew of the midget submarine that got hung up at, on the coral reef on the entrance to Pearl Harbor, and he was captured. He was there, too. And so I figured, well, uh, I challenged uh, Sir Burrow Sakai to Indian arm wrestling. And of course, he didn't know what Indian arm wrestling was, so I explained what it was, see. So we got in there, and I took him four times in a row, see. And after it was all over with, he walked over to the two Japanese, and I knew enough Japanese, and through gestures, I could tell what he was telling these guys. He was telling him that the reason I whipped him was because I had a better pair of shoes on and a more solid platform. So, you know, the guy, <laughs> he wanted to be the champ on the ground as well as in the air. You know, we, you learn pretty fast that you can't blame the, the current generation for what their grandfathers and maybe some of their fathers did. Um, I don't, uh, like I say, I don't carry any, any animosity towards those people at all. I certainly can't respect the system of training that, that uh, 
resulted in the, in the type of personality that were created by that kind of training. Because you want to remember that the Japanese dictionary doesn't even have the word surrender in it. And the worst thing that they can do was to surrender. And the greatest thing they can do, the most honorable thing they could do, would be to, was to die for their emperor. And they believed that. Saburo believed that. I think since that time, though, that he, he probably has some correction in his own mind and judgment, you know, on just how uh, uh, adamant you have to be about this philosophy. They held us in great, great contempt because of surrender. They figured we were cowards, we were traitors, and by our surrender, we were forcing some other guy to go over there and fight for us. And we lived in, under a constant state of intimidation. You didn't know from one minute to the next what the hell they were going to do. I've seen men beaten up, and I was wondering, well, why are they beating them up? What did he do? It's for no reason at all. Their, their whole purpose in life, as I could see it, generally speaking, they wanted us to die. There's no question about it. There was no effort made to, uh, true, they were short on food themselves for a, cer a certain period of time, and they were short on medications. But when the Red Cross supplies came in, there were a lot of medical supplies that were included with, with that shipment. And uh, they kept it from us for several months before they even issued it out. They, uh, see, they were not signatory to the Geneva Convention. They never signed it. In fact, when General King surrendered the forces on Bataan, um, he took a chance. He thought that they would abide by the Geneva Convention, by international law. But he learned real fast that they weren't. But you see, they, they treated themselves that way. During the March of Death, we had, there were 100 men in each group, four abreast. And there was a Jap guard at the head and a Jap guard at the rear. We come to a stop, they change the guard. And this Gunso, which is a sergeant in Japanese, uh, he had this young private would report to him. He'd come to rigid attention. He'd bow. And the Gunso, the sergeant, would just beat the hell out of him. What's going on here? You know, Jap beating up a Jap. So finally, they relieved the sergeant. Another sergeant replaced him. And we continue walking. And after so many miles, we stop again. The little guy wasn't relieved, the guy that, had, that got the beaten. He reported again to this new sergeant of the guard and took another beating. And I said to myself, now wait a minute, this guy has done something wrong and they're not gonna write him a letter of reprimand. This is the way that they maintain law and order amongst their troops. And of course, as time went on, it was very obvious. I mean, they used to beat each other up as terribly. I remember one, one time a, um, in the Davao Penal Colony, the camp that we escaped from, the, uh, there was a young guard and he had taken a watch away from a Major Jackson. And at that time, it was verboten to do that. And of course, the Major Jackson reported it to the American camp commander, who in turn went to the Japanese camp commander and reported it. And I was working in the Jap kitchen at that time. And that particular morning that I went to work, I saw this lad, and there were two guards, one guard on each side of him, and he was in rigid attention. He was a bloody mess. They had beaten him to a pulp. Then finally, he went back on guard duty several days later. In the middle of the night, we heard a shot. What the hell happened here? The next morning when I back, went back to the Jap kitchen, there was a Jap mess sergeant, his name was Abisan, who was very good to me. I, had a great, great love for the guy because he was really good to me at a point when he was taking a chance doing it because if he was observed doing this, showing any, any mercy or compassion to the Americans, they'd be, you know, that, that's the end for them too. So um, Abe told me that, uh, that this lad had shot and killed himself because he didn't want to be sent home in disgrace. It's just hard to explain the, their philosophies. Thank God I don't think that they're that way today. Well, I think that I'm probably a little more compassionate than the average guy. I go down the street and I see some old lady carrying bags, you know, and I, right away I want to stop and help her. Uh, I see someone suffering, it bugs me.
When I was growing up, I'd go to a funeral, and usually I went to a funeral because the guy that was dead was close to me. Okay. And inevitably, you know, Sam's going to cry. But, you know, I go to funerals now, and it doesn't even have any impact on me at all, none at all. And I attribute to the fact that I saw so many people die. You know, it, uh, I was talking to a lad yesterday, Herb Johnson, up in Sam Point, and uh, he was on the March of Death. And we were talking about this very thing. See, and he brought up the subject, you know, that, he, that, uh, that he's, he's hard-hearted. He said, nothing bugs me anymore. And I said, what about your compassion? I said, when you see somebody suffering that's sick, I said, do you, do you feel bad? He said, oh, yeah. I said, well, does, don't you feel there's an inconsistency here that you, know, you say that, that you're cold-hearted, but still you say you see someone suffering, you want to help the guy? He said, that's true. I remember a lad in Cabana de Juan, the name of Johnny Muse was a classmate of mine, and he developed elephantiasis. And he would just look like a monster, you know, his, his body, his head, his arm were three times the size that normally, you know. And he finally stopped eating. He just, he wanted to die. And uh, Leo Golden, again, my buddy, who was a, my classmate. Of course, John was a classmate, too. And um, Leo and I went over to him. He was living in our barracks. He said, look at John. He said, we don't like what we're eating either, but you've got to eat it. You're going to die. He says, Sam, he says, every night before I close my eyes and try to go to sleep, he says, I pray to God that I won't wake up tomorrow morning. You know, they talk about the uh, Jewish Holocaust, which was a terrible thing, no question about it. And they're never going to let us forget it, and they shouldn't let us forget it. The other day, about, about a year ago, I was talking to a senior high school class. And before I started my talk, I said, those of you who have heard the word Batan and Cricket, please raise your hands. Not one hand went up, not even the teachers. And that's a disgrace. So well, Lynn, I, I certainly believe that we should remember it, and you want to remember that our situation was caused by unpreparedness, lack of good intelligence. Look at Pearl Harbor. Nine hours after Pearl Harbor hit, was, was bombed by the Japanese, is when they hit Clark Field, and they cut everybody on the ground. And I have never heard an acceptable explanation for that. Nine hours after Pearl Harbor, 35 B-17s are on the ground with a squadron of P-40s and O-52, the squadron of observation squad, the O-52s. Now, you know, this idea of uh, saving money, that's fine. I, I go, let's, let's remove this deficit we have. But at the same time, God, don't let us ever get into a situation like we were before World War I started, World War II started. That's disgraceful. And I think a, 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 the, the lads growing up today, the history department should emphasize what happened because this is the kind of thing that happens when we're not prepared to defend ourselves. Well, then it meant to me that those that were still alive were going to come home. That was the big thing. Um, like I say, I wrote 2,100 letters to next of kin, and uh, I visited a great number of them too and gave talks to a great number of them all over the country. And you could see their anxiety and what they were going through. We were waiting with no news. And you know, the thought, well, here BJ Day came and if any of them are alive, they're going to get home. That was the most uh, encouraging thing for me to, to hear that the surrender of Japan had occurred was because the prisoners of war would come home. You know, there's a, there's a beautiful relationship between prisoners of war. Uh, I, I see it in the Japanese prisoners of war. I mean, it, it's, uh, there's a love and an affection and a respect. You know, you meet a, a Japanese prisoner of war, right away you want to hug the guy. It's, uh, Why is that? Well, I think it's mutual respect. You suffered with the guy, he suffered with you. Uh, he's experienced a lot of the things that you've experienced. And um, I think a lot of it emanates from respect. The guy survived. Now, a lot of guys died that, uh, uh, I'm not saying that, uh, that they gave up. Not all of them did give up. Most of them wanted to live. There's no question about it. Some of them gave up. There's no doubt about that. But there, there, if you had the will to live, 
and you had a little bit of luck, you're probably going to make it. But a lot of them had the will to live, and they had a lot of luck, and they still died because the Japanese, you know, for any reason at all, would shoot you. Say we escaped on a Sunday morning, April the 4th of 1943, and um, we got into the jungle, we got into a jungle swamp. And a beautiful experience happened in that jungle swamp that I'll never forget. And it's got to do with religion again. We got desperate, we figured there was despair. You know, we're not gonna make it, we're gonna die out here. And the water was about up to my waist because I'm a short guy. The leeches were all over, some mosquitoes all over. And finally, one man suggested that, uh, God, let's go back. Well, if we'd have gone back, they'd killed all of us. And my squadron commander, he said, we need to pray. And he turned to me, he said, Sam, as you're a Catholic, you know how to pray, pray for us. And I'll never forget this, because I recited the Memorare. In fact, I've got it in the book right here, the first, first couple of pages here. And I recited the prayer a sentence at a time, and they would repeat it after me. I mean, just moments before utter desperation, I mean, utter loss of hope, no, no chance. We said that prayer, and if a miracle ever happened in my life, it happened out in the middle of that jungle. I missed one point. Let me digress just a moment. Just before we recited the prayer, we'd heard some machine gun fire and small arms fire. And we could tell by the direction the firing was come from that it was an exchange of fire. And sure enough, that's what happened because 85 Japs came out after us and they were confronted by the guerrillas that we later met. And uh, they took us in tow. At first, they were a little bit dubious as to who we were because, you know, we were at war with Germany and, and Italy. They didn't know who the hell we were, particularly an Italian here. <laughs> and uh, uh, for quite some time, they, they uh, watched us with a lot of caution. They, they were very critical about, you know, are these guys really Americans? I didn't mention that we did have two Filipinos that escaped with us, Benigno de la Cruz and Victor Humerong. And uh, Victor had killed two people, murdered two people, and Ben had killed one person. Ben was a victim of circumstances. I think Victor was, he was a bit on the, uh, well, on the unstable side would probably be a good word for it, yeah, because I, I, I don't want to run the guy down because he was very, uh, helpful to us. I mean, without the two Filipinos, we, I, I don't think we'd have made it because they, we got into this jungle swamp and shortly thereafter, we got into a grove of what I call a sword grass. It looked like a rubber plant that had thorns sticking out the end of it and it was above our heads. Fortunately, we were able to smuggle out some bolos before we left. And in fact, we cached them along the intended escape route. And, uh, Benigno de la Cruz and Victor Humerong, they cut through, but then they finally got exhausted. So we took turns cutting. But you can imagine, here I'm weighing about 85 pounds, and I didn't do a hell of a lot cutting. But it, it was rough going, I'll tell you. It was, uh, you take a step, and uh, your foot would just stick in the muck and the mire, in the mud. And I had to get my hind, pull up my, my leg to help me take another step. You know, if we'd make 50 yards in an hour, we were doing great. And that's what finally uh, culminated in uh, this one person saying, hell, let's go back. We figured that this is it. We finally got onto dry land and we got out of the swamp and got onto dry land. Uh, there were several trails that went in various directions. And we started walking down this one trail and the Marine, who's infantry moxie, you know, he, he said, wait a minute, he says, uh, we all better take separate trails. If we get ambushed, they're gonna kill all of us. Because we'd heard this firing, say, but like I say, we were encouraged by the, where the sounds were coming from, the direction of the fire. We figured it was an exchange of fire. And then we figured, hell, the guerrillas, because uh, we knew, we, let's, uh, I shouldn't say we knew, but we heard that there were guerrillas in this area and we were heading for that general area, see? So anyway, we um, uh, took separate trails and these individual trails all converged 
onto one big trail. And we picked up the trail and walked a short distance. We came to a railroad track. And around the railroad track was a little bodega. It's a little small warehouse. And alongside there was a smoldering fire, expended Japanese 25 caliber ammunition, bloody Japanese G-strings, uh, emergency rations. Then we knew hell. They, but we don't know where they are. Well, we used that fire to cook some rice for ourselves and some tea that we got out of the camp. Then we started out in the direction that some of the supervisors in the camp had told us about where we might reach the grill of horses. So we're going down this railroad track and we see two figures coming in the opposite direction and they were quite a distance away. We couldn't identify whether, whether they're Japs or who they are. So the uh, nine of us jumped off the side of the track and got right to the edge of the jungle. But Ed Dias, my squadron commander, he just kept walking down the track and finally we saw this one guy raise his rifle, but no shot. They make a 180 degree turn and they run down the railroad track and we chase them. And finally the track came to an end and off the end of the, uh, the track into the jungle there was a trail. So we picked up this trail, walked for not too long, I don't know, maybe, maybe an hour, an hour and a half, something like that. And uh, we came to a clearing in the jungle and there was an old hunchback Filipino and he's cultivating his rice, seed, rice seedlings. Well, our two Filipino boys, Benigno de la, uh, de la Cruz and Victor, they go and talk to him and ask him if, if there's gorillas around. And he said, yes, there's gorillas, but I can't take you to them. I'll go and tell them you're here. In the meantime, he told his wife to fix us something to eat. So she cooked some rice for us and, whatever, and we were, oh God, we were filthy. You know, from leeches and uh, uh, you'd pull those leeches off you and they'd break the skin. I've got, I've got tropical ulcers all over my legs from, from those damn leeches. But anyway, um, she finished, uh, we finished eating and there was a well right beside this house. And there was a bucket and we took turns giving each other a bath. And while we were taking, taking our baths, we heard a shrill whistle. And here comes this one Filipino with a 45 and carrying a Browning automatic rifle. And then finally, apparently he was casing what was going on and he gave the signal and hell they came from everywhere. Gorillas all over the damn place. And they, they surrounded us, they didn't abuse us. And we kept telling them we're Americans, we're Americans. You know, the Annapolis graduate, West Pointer here, uh, fires, what have you. So they're going to take us to a little village. So they brought us to a little village and there was a townhouse there. Bamboo floors, bamboo walls, thatched roof. And they put us in there. And then by this time we, we were eating pretty good. After about two or three days we, uh, you know, we began to feel pretty good. We were getting, getting our strength back and our morale was good. Um, the, the guerrilla leader there was Cassiano de Juan. He was a tall Filipino, unlike most Filipinos, he's tall. And he was from Davao, from Davao City. And so we told him that, uh, look, at, uh, we're, we're not your enemy. We're, 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 we're Americans that escaped from the Davao. And then, then we said, look at us, look at the condition we're in. You know, we're not, we're not healthy soldiers from Italy or Germany. So anyway, like I say, they brought us to the townhouse and we stayed there for a while. And finally, they told us that there was a Claro Loretto that was ahead of all the guerrilla forces in that area. And that uh, they were gonna get word to him that we were there. And then he's gonna have to make a decision what he wants to do. So a few days later, I noticed several strange faces in the area. Some of them carrying Browning automatic rifles, 45s, infield rifles. What the hell is going on here? And then finally McCoy says, well, he's, I'll bet that that's the advance party, that Clever Loretta is not going to come in here and get ambushed. He doesn't know who the hell we are either. So finally, Clever Loretta shows up. He was a major. He had gone through the West Point of the Philippines. I met his son in, in Manila on the, in 1986. But he, um, the way he determined that we were in fact Americans, 
and military people, he was asking questions about the code of military justice in the book. Well, hell, I didn't have any answers, but the hell, the West Pointer and, and McCoy being Annapolis guy, the hell, he gave the answers like that. And this guy was sharp. He's, he's dead now. So then finally he said, all right, he told us that the main body of guerrillas were probably about a month's walk over unexplored territory through uh, tribal areas where the Atahs were, the Mugga Huts, the Manobos, all these people that live in trees and carry spears and bow and arrows with them, see? And he says, I'm going to equip you. We'll get you some cargoed arrows. We'll get some Atah cargoed arrows. The little guy is about like this. And he said, they'll carry your bags. And it was amazing, these little guys, that they could carry 100 pounds forever, you know. And they lived on betel nut. Their lips were red, their teeth are red from chewing betel nut. But uh, we named one of them, uh, oh, he was just, just a little guy. I remember we, 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 we'd address, hey, betel nut, betel nut. He'd look up, yeah. But anyway, make a long story short here now. I'm going too long. Um, they equip us. They gave us chickens. They made jerkies for us out of carabao. We carried a pig with us in a cage. And we finally get into the area where the maps met marked unexplored. And I'll never forget this, because in a distance, I see this guy wrapped up in a, in a white sheet. He's like Mahatma Gandhi. So who the hell is this? So we finally got up close to him. And here he is living in a lean-to living on commodities is an American, a Spanish-American war veteran that had evacuated uh, Davao because of the Japanese and was living with these four women, toothless women. And you know, he's an old guy and uh, we tried to get him to go with us, but he, he no, no, he said, I've been here all this time, I'm gonna stay, and he wouldn't go with us. So we continued on, we finally get to uh, uh, a place called Libertad. And there was a Lieutenant Antonio there that was command of the small guerrilla force. And he had a command post. He was in a, in a bamboo house. And draped on the wall behind him was the American flag and the Filipino flag. And I'll tell you, you can't imagine the emotion that that, that evoked because uh, the last time I'd seen the American flag and the others was on Bataan at the surrender and they, they desecrated it. You know, they, they uh, used it for disc claws, they tore it up, they burned it, and what have you. And it's just amazing what that experience did to all of us. We all started crying. And uh, yeah. we um, met a fellow named McLish, and he uh, took good care of us, clothed us, armed us, and then three of them got out three months later on the first submarine, and I got out on the second submarine, the Bofin, which is currently right next to the Arizona as a memorial. Well, here it is right here. That's, that's it. You can see the number of ships they sunk. They sunk two while I was on board. But anyway, um, I got the word. I was building an airfield with Leo Bones who was recaptured and, and killed. He was from Basin, Wyoming. And uh, I had gone through the headquarters. It was commanded by a general, not general, but Colonel Fertig, Wendell Fertig from Colorado. He was a mining engineer that was inducted in the service, not inducted, but joined the, the, uh, the army and uh, was commissioned. And uh, when I went through this headquarters, he told me that the next submarine that comes in, we're gonna get you out. You're a pilot and you'll be a real asset. For the, for the forces that are coming back in, you know, knowing where the guerrillas are and where, where the Japs are located and all this sort of thing, for intelligence purposes. So I went and I joined Leo Bolins, who had already arrived there several weeks before I got there. And the reason I went there was because Dias, when he came through on his way to meet the submarine, he asked me to go to where Leo was building this airfield because he was sick and there's no other Americans around there. He said he needs company, he needs some, some morale support, see? So I finally decided to go, I made, made this trip over there where, where Leo was. And I'll never forget the day I, I got this, well, uh, let me digress a moment here. Uh, Ferdy told me, he says, now, we'll get a message to you. 
and the message will say something like this, that uh, to come to a certain place, designated place, where you'll meet the submarine. Well, I had been with Leo for quite a while, you know, maybe probably three months. Yeah. And he knows I'm leaving. See? And that, he wrote me a couple of notes that are in here. I can't say them because I break down again, but I want you to read those notes. Um, you got to keep in mind that, uh, you know, we were what, uh, I was 24 years old. Leo was about the same age. So you, you do things and say things that are not from the mouths of real mature people. But he was very sentimental in this letter. And I remember that I told him, I said, Leo, I don't have to go out on this sub. I said, hell, as we've been together all this time, we went through the escape together. I said, I'll stay and wait until you can go out. If you do that, he said, you're going to make it tough on all of us. People back in Australia are going to say, here's a guy offered a chance to, to get out of here. And he's turned it down. He says, and uh, that's going to give the wrong impression. And he was, he was right, no question about it. But he said, you got to go. He said, because your job is you're, you're a pilot. And you, you're more important to them than, than I am as an engineer. So, I'd say. so anyway, I rendezvoused with a submarine. And um, it was about 7.30 at night that I got on board. And all I had was a G-string on because I gave all the clothes I had to some, the Filipinos. And I had a young lad with me who was my bodyguard that stayed with me all the time, Benigno del Mundo. He was from the island of Cebu. And uh, I'll never forget, uh, I tried to find him uh, when I was back in, in, in Manila in, in 86 and uh, no one could locate him for me. It was a good experience. I wanted to go back primarily because I wanted to see if the Filipino people were the same as they were when I was over there. You want to remember that in 1943, when I left, the population of the Philippines was something like 17 million. Today, I'm sure it's getting close to 60 million. And um, we found, you know, the Filipinos still love Americans, no question about it. When I was with the guerrillas, I used to ask the Filipinos, now come July the 4th of 1946, you're going to be given your independence. We had that commitment with them, see. I never talked to one Filipino that said, no, no, we don't want our independence. We don't want the Americans to leave. We want the Americans to stay. We love America. Yeah, there, there was a certain amount of guilt, and I carried it with me until the surrender. And finally, when, not till the surrender, actually, it was before, because there was a group of people that were rescued by the Rangers out of Commander Nguyen, led by uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mochi. And uh, one was a very close friend of mine who had been in the camp that I escaped from. His name is Burt Bank. He was a former senator in, in the House of Representatives of the state of Alabama. And uh, Burt came home and I met him when he got off the, the ship. And uh, of course, the first thing I asked, I said, Burt, what the hell do they do to you guys? He said, nothing. He said, they put us in a, in a period of meditation where we had to meditate on the great sin you committed against, against the emperor, uh, that you would leave after him you know, being uh, so, uh, not, not the emperor, but that they, because of the fact that uh, I guess that we survived, that they felt that conditions couldn't be too tough. But that other than that, and they did deny him a certain amount of food, but other than that, nothing. And the interesting thing, Lynn, is the fact that I talked to many of them afterwards and asked them, I said, do you have any bitterness and resentment towards me because I left? Hell no, as we all cheered you, we were all happy because we did hear that you guys made it. And, uh, but up to that time, it, it, was, it was difficult, really. You know, when I see a lad that's been to war, one of the first thoughts that comes to my mind is, that guy helped me preserve freedom. Freedom presupposes law and order. If you don't have law and order, you can't have freedom. And that's what these boys that wear the uniform represent. They, they maintain, in a sense, law and order. Um, Look, look what happened in Oklahoma City when they bombed that building. Uh, there was a complete denial of freedom there for those people for, for a, quite a long time, and they're still suffering from it. And um, again, didn't they call the military in there to help for certain phases of the work, the reconstruction work in that? 
you know, you look almost anywhere in the world today, there's a guy in uniform, an American guy in uniform someplace. Somalia, Haiti, the Desert War, Grenada. Um, they, they deserve the highest of respect. They certainly get it from me, I'll tell you.